Have you been a regular Media Watch viewer over the years and what do you think of the program? Most of us are regular viewers of Media Watch and uh, no, I think most of us enjoy it, uh, particularly when it's not about us. Uh, is there a place for Media Watch today? Yeah, I think the program has a, um, a real role. What sort of role? I guess I feel um, a television watchdog for media ethics is an important thing. I guess, like a lot of people in the business, I sometimes feel the program can hook up on small picture things. I think it can be too ideological. I think it can sometimes um, cater to a demographic prejudice amongst its own audience. Now, just on um, attacking small, smaller concerns, we've interviewed the editor of the NT News. The NT News is constantly coming under attack. For the crocodile stories, yeah. Yeah, what do you think? Is that just like shooting fish in the bucket? Is that too easy? Look, I think it's probably fair enough to do it occasionally, but it can be a default position when there's not a serious issue around. Um, I think probably more concerning for me would be the tendency of the program to look down its nose at products and readers that have possibly uh, catered to a different demographic from the program's own. So I think there is a tendency to be snide about the Telegraph um, because it makes you know, people in the program or viewers of the program feel good for not being tele readers and perhaps being Sydney Morning Herald readers. But I would argue that the Telegraph does a particularly good job for its demographic. Do you think Meeting Watch makes any difference at all to the way your journalists behave in the field? Yeah, I don't think it would influence the way people behave in the field. Um, and in some ways it's probably similar um, to the way we might feel about a legal issue. You know, I think editors um, often decide to defame someone uh, or to break a law, for instance, a law that might prevent you identifying a child. We know that Media Watch will squeal about that. Um, we know that an attorney general in a very in, a, in one state or another will um, you know, try to take action about it. But you might occasionally decide that the story is worth um, that sort of function. Um, Media Watch won the Gold Warby for its coverage of the Cash for Comment um, affair. Do you think that uh, was well earned? I think Media Watch deserved an award for that story. I think. Um, listeners to John Laws and Alan Jones had a right to know um, that payments were being made for, for comment. Um, John Laws, who we're interviewing tomorrow, says that he didn't do anything wrong, he was just looking after his sponsors. Well, and, and I guess John always um, uses the defence that he's not a journalist. Um, it's not clear that listeners understand that. Okay, now, um, can you explain to me what were the culture wars and what impact did they have on the media? Look, I, I'm not sure that the culture war issue has the sort of effect in this country that it does in the United States. To my way of thinking, it was probably played out through the prism of individuals' views of John Howard. I think there were those in the media who saw Howard as a kind of a ideological warrior um, and then saw anybody who defended anything Howard did as being you know, a culture warrior for Howard. I think in hindsight that was all wrong. I think our critique of Howard during the Howard years was that he was too pragmatic. We would have liked him to be more ideological. Um, we think Howard sort of um, gave too much money to every demographic group used too much welfare churn, um, bought off too many sections of the electorate and probably didn't govern well enough for the country as a whole. Um, similarly, I would argue um, our treatment of Howard on issues like children overboard, which we broke in 2001 and which we reprised in the 2004 election with the Mike Scrafton story. Um, our treatment of the AWB scandal, Dr Hanif, would suggest that the Oz, which was often sort of branded as a culture warrior in favour of Howard, actually pursued the media stories against him. Now, some people believe Media Watch became a small 
very small part of the culture wars, with presenters like David Ma railing against coverage of Iraq and, and so-called anti-Muslim stories. Do you think Media Watch did become a, a small part under David Ma in the culture wars? Well, you know, I think, um, you know, David would argue that Janet Albrechtson is a cultural warrior, and I think she would say David is. Um, I think there is a cogent argument to be made in favour of the Iraq War still, and I think um, people in the last few weeks have seen um, a fairly successful electoral process in Iraq. I think the general takeout today is that Iraq was a far more successful adventure than Afghanistan to date. Um, and I think views about the war became um, a de facto analysis of your views about George Bush. Very few people were able to separate um, the rights and wrongs of trying to establish a democracy in Iraq from their views of the Bush administration. I think on um, Muslims generally, um, you know, whatever flaws David found in Janet's reporting of the issue of um, Muslim rape um, probably were overblown. I think probably David was reflecting the critique of Amir Butler um, and I think Janet's defence of herself wasn't well played out on air. I think it, she got a fairer hearing on the Media Watch website than she ever got on the program. And I think the substance of her her um, commentary was not remarkable. I think there's been a lot written uh, in the continent um, about uh, Muslim violence, particularly in the outer suburbs of Paris and uh, London. And I think most of what David railed against would be accepted today by most thinking people, even on the left, actually. Yeah. Ma was partic particularly critical of, of Janet. Um, over one story in which she claimed she misused the work of European academics to pursue her own arguments. Is that a correct reading of the situation? I think he, like many people um, on the left, or many lawyers, he found a flaw in her work and he then used that flaw to extrapolate a wider flaw in her entire argument. Now, I'm not going to argue that there was no flaw in her work. But what I would argue is that it was a fair representation of the Danish research that she was quoting. Ma claims he didn't have any sort of ideological battle with uh, Albrechtson, that he simply found that she was wrong. What do you think? Um, I think David was obsessed with Janet. I think um, the truth is David you know, sent the Media Watch team out looking for dirt on Janet's previous legal business interests, which I find remarkable. I mean, I, it's never occurred to me that I should investigate David's business interests. Now, some critics accuse David Maher of being too left-wing. What's your view? I suppose my view would be um, there were too many uh, compares from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, there was not enough vetting to make sure those compares were not simply pushing a commercial agenda against Fairfax's competitors. Um, I think David is unambiguously a creature of the left, but I don't think that particularly matters. Um, and I don't really buy into this argument that Media Watch needs a conservative um, host. But I think it needs a host who understands the media better. Um, you know, Media Watch is not a creature of news and current affairs, it's a creature of entertainment. It, it, it caters to the prejudices of ABC viewers, um, as does the Herald, as does the Telegraph, as do uh, my readers receive their prejudices reinforced regularly. Uh, did Mark give equal attention to Fairfax newspapers? I don't think so. Can you talk about that? Well, I think David, you know, um, gleefully um, picked at Campbell Reid whenever he had the opportunity. And I think it was that kind of um, snooty Sydney Morning Herald looking down your nose at the Telegraph. You know, I've worked at Fairfax. Um, I, it struck me as a particularly sort of 
odd place. It was full of left-wing journalists who loved to hate the poor. Now, David uh, makes some, some strong criticism of the Australian newspaper. He claims that every other media organisation could take criticism except for the Australian. Well, I mean, I think our position is if we feel um, David, David's criticism or any compare's criticism is not correct, um, we have a go back. I mean, I'll give you an example, but I don't want to focus on David Mayer because I don't particularly, you know, sort of think about that period. But, say, two years ago with Monica and Tim Palmer, um, you know, probably the Oz was the most regular subject of Media Watch criticism. And yet that year we got the gold Walkley for the Hanif story and uh, we won the Graham Perkin Award for Journalist of the Year for our reporting on Palm Island of the death of Cameron Dumaji. Um, I think that year um, we relaunched our business section and you know we were probably the only newspaper that year that was increasing circulation organically. Most people I speak to, whether it's in the federal government or the state government or senior business circles or academic circles would say that The Australian is the best paper in the country. Genu gen generally regarded as the best paper in the country. Most, most other editors will tell you that. And yet um, the program fixated on this newspaper as if it were some kind of crazy rag. You know, we have the biggest staff in Australia, the most foreign, foreign correspondents, the best political staff in Canberra. It's an odd sort of thing that we would be the subject of so much attention. I think we're subject to that sort of attention because we're Rupert's flagship and because we're unashamedly positioned on the centre-right of politics. We're not a sort of a centre-left newspaper. I think it's hard to be positioned on the centre-right when mainstream media opinion is on the centre-left. Um, that doesn't take account, though, of the position of my readers. You know, my readers tend to be high-income-earning uh, decision-makers in business and politics, academia, and they like what they read in our paper. They're probably very similar in their views to the paper's views. Liz Jackson, a former presenter, said the Australians saw Media Watch as promoting a soft left view within the culture wars, and they felt they could use this to undermine Media Watch. If they could say Media Watch was was really independent, wasn't really independent journalism, then any sins they may have committed would be wiped clean. Well, I think that's sort of a silly position. I think what I'd say is in the, in the wider ABC, there is a problem that all media face today. I think we've all allowed PR and spin to kind of dominate our news judgments. Now I'd say within the Sydney Morning Herald and within the ABC, that spin tends to be that which comes from um, conservation groups or um, activist lobby groups within society. Now all of those lobby groups have a right to express a view, but I think the default position from which news reports are built within the ABC and Fairfax tends to adopt that view of those groups so that their positioning is a kind of a Bob Brown view of the world. Now, of course, my readers aren't readers who would be particularly in a mood of that kind of view of the world. And I'm sure we have um, PR and spin um, influencing our judgments as well, but they're more likely to be the Centre for, Centre for Independent Studies than Greenpeace. Now, just um, another... Former staffer and executive producer Peter McAvoy claims Media Watch was drawn into the culture wars because of a lot of opinion writers, uh, be they left or right, he claims. He says that um, opinion writers write columns off the top of their heads and would often get things wrong, and that's why Media Watch paid attention to them. Um, I think Peter probably has a point, but to accept that he was accurate, I would have to believe that Media Watch paid as much attention to David Maher as it did to Jared Henderson and Andrew Bolt. And I don't think that's the case. I think the program has celebrated um, its attacks on Janet and Andrew and seldom critiqued columnists on the left. And I think those left-wing columnists, my own left-wing columnists, have never been critiqued by Media Watch. 
I think Mike Steckerty has had a weekly column in the paper for 12 years and I've never heard his name mentioned. Now onto another topic. Um, just in a nutshell, can you explain to me what the Brissett and Peter Costello off the record controversy was about? I guess uh, Michael Brissenden must have um, agonised about whether to break the um, confidential, confidentiality arrangements at the dinner. Um, and I guess Peter Costello spoke frankly because he thought it was an off the record dinner and, of, and that his comments were by way of background. I think probably it was a mistake um, to break those sorts of confidentiality uh, arrangements. Uh, I think it's in all our interest to be able to have free and frank exchanges with politicians. Um, I've probably had, you know, half a dozen such uh, such lunches and dinners with Peter Costello and dozens with Kevin Rudd, and it's never occurred to me that um, things that they were saying off the record should be on the record. So now, Media Watch didn't cover that 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 story. Do you think they should have? And and if so, why? Well, it strikes me that that year there were two important stories that Media Watch didn't cover. Um, didn't cover the Brissenden affair, which I would have thought was pretty central to journalistic ethics, and it didn't cover the uh, Sydney Morning Herald's HMA Sydney debacle, um, where the Herald splashed on uh, the finding of the Sydney, paid for the story, so it was, it was a sort of a cash for comment story, and uh, the Sydney turned out to be a barge. And I shudder to think what would have happened if the Oz had been involved in that story. I think more seriously, you are alluding to a point about um, the types of stories Media Watch does cover. It seems to me lots of um, my own disputes with government, for instance, on you know conclusive certificates and FOI were untouched by Media Watch. A lot of serious ethical issues within the profession get much less attention than spelling mistakes in local suburban newspapers. Just on that, um, what do you think it says about Media Watch not covering the Brissenden Costello story? The executive, part, executive producer, Tim Palmer, apparently said he didn't cover the Brissenden Costello story because there was nothing new to say. What do you think of that as an excuse? Well, I think if Tim thought more carefully about the Brissenden and Costello story, he probably might reflect that he could have written a whole book about it. The, um, the story is pretty central to the way journalists do business and, and how they do business with politicians. Um, and I could think of um, stories of much greater import um, that were protected for years. I think when Paul Kelly finally broke the story of the curability agreement, um, you know, to pass the Prime Ministership from Bob Hawke to um, Paul Keating. He'd known about it for three years. Now, over the 20 years that Media Watch has been going, it has featured a number of stories about plagiarism. Um, can you tell me if you think plagiarism is still an issue today or if, if, the, if that sort of um, sin, media sin, if you like, is not as common as it used to be? I think plagiarism is kind of all pervasive in society and um, you know, I've seen my own children cut and paste from the internet entire HSC assignments. It seems to me that Media Watch has done a good job on alerting uh, all of us to the dangers of just relying on things we find online. So at one level you had more old fashioned kinds of plagiarism that you know relied on going to the library and getting the cuts and lifting the cuts without attribution, attribution and that was bad enough but I think nowadays we all use the internet as such a powerful research tool there is a temptation um, to lift things or to not check things and uh, one of the I suppose one of the obvious points to make about the internet is it possibly is the least reliable source of information one can find the broadest but least reliable Jonathan Holmes last year criticised Fairfax Media saying it was risking its reputation for quality journalism by running sensational stories and trivia online. Do you agree? I think this is a big issue for publishers, the, you know, the extent to which um, your online offering is similar to your in-paper offering. I've tried quite 
diligently, I would say, um, to keep our online offering as similar to the paper as possible. Um, we we are unambiguously serious. You know, we have very large commitments to higher education online and science online and the arts. Um, and it would be easy, I'm sure, to get more eyeballs were we simply to be trawling in the same territory as the Herald or the Telly or the Herald Sun. Um, but I don't believe that it's an effective strategy. I think it, it muddies the brand values of the paper. And I think in the longer term, it might actually be commercially uh, silly as well. I'm not sure that um, fishing in the same pond for a wide demographic at a very low advertising rate is as effective as fishing in a much rarer pond for a higher payer. So what do I mean by that? I mean, my cost per thousand on IT recruitment online is a thousand, is a hundred dollars per thousand clicks. Uh, most of the news websites in Australia will be getting less than seven dollars per thousand. So I'd rather fish in a pond for a hundred dollars than for seven. Now look, just last question. Um, what would you like to see on Media Watch if, if you were the executive producer? What would you do with the program? Well, I think Jonathan is a good um, presenter, and I'm not saying that for totally selfish reasons. I think he has brought to it a kind of a lightness of touch without the sort of sneering that sometimes uh, marked Stuart Littlemore or David Maher. And I also think Jonathan is a good journalist. I think he understands um, you know, the problems of news gathering in a, in a competitive environment in which things happen quickly and you have to make decisions quickly. And it strikes me that both Monica Attard and uh, Jonathan were good presenters um, and it was good to get away from the Herald.